All right, guys. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Sorry, there's no uh, coffee or uh, decaf tonight. Uh, we have uh, my in-laws are in town, and uh, it's good. It's a good thing. It's a good thing, and uh, they uh, they are in town, and uh, but so we're kind of busy at our house, so we didn't have time to cook up some coffee for you. But it will be here next week, and. Uh, Praise the Lord. So with that said, open our Bibles to Second Chronicles. We got God's Word. Solomon's Secret to Success is what we're going to be looking at tonight. And we're starting a new book. You got that new book smell? And so let's pray and get started. Amen. Dear Lord, we love you. We praise your holy name. And tonight, Lord, we just want to uh, just thank you for being in our presence. Lord, we just thank you for your healing hand with Dale. Lord, we ask that you would just be with Donna right now, and she's in the hospital, Lord. Be with her. Heal her up, Lord, and be with Tim, and he's having surgery to relieve pressure on his brain from a stroke. So, Lord, we lift up uh, Jeannie's husband, Tim, right now, that you just bless the recovery for that surgery. We ask for mercy that he would call out to you, Lord, and give his life to you in these very serious situations. And so, Lord, we lift up those who are sick in the body, that you just keep on healing them. And, Lord, thank you for those who are well. Just uh, your grace upon our, on our, our, our church, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And tonight, as we start this new book, we ask that you would just speak to us, grow us in it. A book that usually not a lot of people study because of its, uh, the name, the, the location, and we ask that you would just, uh, Lord, teach us the sweet things, the bitter things, the tough parts, the meaty parts, the good parts. Lord, we want your full counsel from your word. So, Lord, just fill us overflowing with your Holy Spirit right now. Wash us and cleanse us in the blood so that we may understand your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Chronicles, of course, First and Second Chronicles are one book. They're not two books. Well, we're, they're two books in our Bible because they were so, it was such a big book. So they cut it in half. And so when they cut it in half, uh, you have First and Second Chronicles. First Chronicles, of course, is, um, it's, uh, a lot of people dog on it. The first seven chapters are just a bunch of listings. And names and people go, oh, why are we studying this book? It's so boring, you know. Uh, let's skip ahead, you know. And uh, no, no, no. It was it's some good stuff. Remember those listings, even though they're big and thorough, they were for the exiles coming back from Babylon. Remember, uh, the whole of Judah is going to be taken away captive. When they are going to be taken away captive, they're going to come back and it's going to be disorder. Well, Chronicles is going to help them find out what's going on, and so. It's going to be a tremendous help for him. Thank God that stuff was there for those returning exiles. Also in First Chronicles, there's a focus on um, the Levites, the tribes, jobs and positions, and also a focus on the life of David, which we finished uh, a week ago. And we saw that life of David. Pretty much, it's two books boiled down into one. First Chronicles covers what First and Second Samuel covered. But then also... We see Second Chronicles pop up. Now, Second Chronicles is just like that. Um, it's a boiling down of First and Second Kings. We've covered this already. We've covered the stuff that's going to be going through in First and Second Kings. But the focus in Second Chronicles is on the throne or that lineage of David's descendants in the in that the nation of Judah. Remember, they're going to have a split. Israel, ten tribes are going to go north. Judah in the south. And there's going to be a split. And the focus on Second Chronicles is that Davidic line, the throne of David, that royal line of David, all the way through to the day that Babylon takes them away into captivity. There is no back and forth in Chronicles. In First and Second Kings, you see, uh, it was kind of hard to track sometimes, right? Uh, we had to have, a, have an outline. We had to have a listing of what kings were which. These are the kings of Israel. These are the kings of, it, of Judah. And it would go back and forth, back and forth. You don't get that in Second Chronicles. It is a complete list of only the kings of Judah. The focus is on Judah, Jerusalem, and the temple. 
So all the kings of Judah will be take uh, will, will will study them all. But the kings of Israel, only a few of them will be mentioned when they're connected with the kings of Judah. Also, you're going to see the growing rebellion that's going to happen in Judah. Now, remember, with Israel, it's straight, like, it, <laughs> their spiritual life is like going down Shell Street and Signal Hill uh, with no brakes, okay? That is what the spiritual life and leadership of Israel was all about. But this is the deal. When you look at Judah, Judah has some ups and downs. It's like Loin Street. It just it has some ups and downs. Okay, it just has some ups and downs. And so Judah has these really high highs, really low lows, and then in between it's it's like an it's like a atrial fibrillation, Loin Street. Okay, it's all over the place, and that's what Judah and the kings are all about. So you have these two books in one. And it, it, the outline is chapters 1 through 9, all about Solomon, this great king of Israel. Then you have around 10, 11, you have three chapters about Rehoboam. Then you have a whole list from chapter 13 through chapter 36 of the kings of Judah. And we'll go through them all. Solomon's section, chapters 1 through 9, is covered in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. And here we see a whole bunch of stuff about Solomon, but this is the thing. This is what you don't see. It's really weird. It's really boiled down. In 1 Kings 2 through 11, you see a whole bunch of stuff. Way more narration. But in Chronicles, in the first nine chapters, in the life of Solomon, you don't see the Adonijah rebellion. You don't see his marriage to his first wife, who's the Egyptian princess. You don't see his wife's judgments where he says, let's chop the baby in half. Remember that one? You know, you don't, you don't see that in Chronicles. You don't see his glory. You don't see his officers, all of that listing of officers. You don't have details about his palace, which was glitzy and glamorous. You don't hear, and this, oh, you don't hear about his idolatry. You really don't hear a lot about that in Chronicles, and you don't hear about the wars that he fought. So you see, it's a lot more streamlined in Chronicles Second Chronicles focuses, though, on Solomon and especially his relationship to the temple and his building the kingdom. That's it. It's very specific, Chronicles is. And so let's just tackle it in verse 1. It says, Now Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and exalted Solomon exceedingly. Solomon was strengthened, it said, in his kingdom. Boy, that was the truth. Here's a guy that had, he was anointed two times. Ooh, two times. The first time was kind of like an emergency anointing as king because his brother Adonijah was trying to take over his half-brother. And so Adonijah's out there riding around town going, I'm the king, I'm the king. And then, then uh, Nathan the prophet, Bathsheba, his mom hears about this and they go, oh, 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 we can't let this happen. And David, they said, David, you're going to have to get, get your old bones up. And you're going to have to make your son king. And boy, did he. So he had the first emergency anointing. And then he had the second more formal one. So he had two coronations. Solomon did. So yeah, he was strengthened in his kingdom. David also prepared all the materials for him to build the temple. He had all the money, all the wealth, all the materials ready to go for him. David had that all prepared. He was charged, challenged, tasked, instructed, commissioned by David to build the temple. And then also he was prayed over, committed to God in a powerful way in 1 Chronicles 29, 19. Prayed over, committed to God. God, there you go. This kid belongs to you. Now get this, even though he was strengthened in his kingdom, even though all this was done for Solomon, he had to make a personal decision on his own, from the heart, to do it. And to live for the Lord. Notice what it says. It says that the Lord was with him and exalted him exceedingly. That's true. And you know what? This is the ultimate source of strength for any person. Don't we all want to be strong in the Lord? How do you get strong in the Lord? How is that possible? 
Well, it says here where the, the Lord God was with him and the Lord what, God ex exalted him exceedingly. But don't, don't you see the thing that's the common denominator here? God is the one who does it. God is the one who strengthens. You can't go to a conference and say, okay, I'm going to go to this conference and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build myself up spiritually. I'm going to go to this, I'm going to take this spiritual Tony Robbins course. I'm going to take this spiritual rah-rah class and I'm going to get into it. And I'm going to, oh, and, oh, you know, if the band's lit, the, the band has to be on. It has to be smoke machines and laser shows in the worship. And then we all have to do the Hillsong Hop. <laughs> and we have to do all that stuff. And I got to get charged up in order for me to get strength. And you know, that pastor better bring it and he better be funny. He better be engaging or I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to be strong in the Lord. Listen, there's a lot of people that believe that. And you know what? That's one of my favorite, favorite things to say. It's Oscar Mayer. It's just baloney. It just is. How do you get strong in the Lord? It's not through uh, spiritual uh, calisthenics or rah-rah classes. Uh, it's not through that. It comes down to a couple things. If you're writing down notes tonight, just jot this down. Philippians 4.13 Philippians 4.13, listen to what it says. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christian rah-rah classes. No, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, so where does strength come from? Through who? Christ. Do you know that Christ is the sole source of all of our strength? It's through Jesus. Jesus. That's Philippians 4.13. Well, here's another verse for you. Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, God is talking. He says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. You know what dismayed means? Freaked out. Don't be freaked out. For I am your God. And then God says, I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And you know what that is? That's called a promise. Aren't promises rad? Promises are rad when they're from a person that really keeps his promises. And guess what? God has made us a promise and he never breaks them. Isn't that neat? Psalm, in Isaiah 41, 10, I'm with you, be not, don't freak out. I'm your God and I will what? Strengthen you. So we can see that Strength is a promise from God. If you're taking notes, write this one down. Isaiah 40, 31. Isaiah 40, 31 says this. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How do we get strength according to this verse? We get strength in God, spiritual strength in God, when we simply wait upon the Lord. Well, what does that mean, Pastor Andrew? It means I just got to sit on my duff all day and just, okay, God, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for my strength. Where is it at? No. You know what it means waiting on the Lord? It means that it means you stop what you're doing to try to get strength and you wait on him to deliver it. I'm going to let the Lord work. I'm going to let him, his time rule. So often we try to force strength and yet we try, it, listen, if we try to make our own strength, God, it's going to be pitiful, but we have to wait upon the Lord. Let the Lord do the work and have patience in it. Do you need that today? First Chronicles 16.11, if you're taking notes, First Chronicles 16.11 says this, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. So notice the word that's used there is seek. Do you need strength in your spiritual life? Maybe you feel like you have just, you're a total weakling spiritually. At the end of your robe, totally just jello. Guys, if that's the case, start seeking the face of God. When we seek the Lord, look what it says. Seek the Lord 
and his strength. The strength of God, when God gives strength to his people, it's something to be sought after. Seek it. Seek his face. I love seeking the face of God. You're like, what does that mean, seeking the face? Where is the face of God? You know, have you ever thought about the face of God? That's gnarly, huh? You know, you think, oh, you know, it's bright. It's like, a, it's like the sun. What's the face of God look like? Some people think it looks like, you know, Jesus. You know, is it like the, the, I call it the Italian Fabio Jesus. You know, the, uh, the, 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 you know, the grandma one. The grandma, it's on every grandma's wall. The picture of Jesus. And you know, we have, you know, we have those things when you see someone and they have a certain look, you go, man, that guy looks like Jesus. That's not what he looked like. We have no clue what Jesus looked like at all. But what is the face of God? Some people think the face of God looks like that. Or some people think the face of God is like what Michelangelo painted or some type of thing on the Sistine Chapel ceiling where it's an old man with a gray or a white long beard. And he looks at you and he's mad. He looks like a mad old white guy. Just up there with a big old long beard and just like, oh, with a lightning bolt in his hand. No, 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 that's not God. That's Zeus. That's Zeus. Look at the mythologies. That's not what God looks like. What's the face of God? Well, what does the face have on it? It has eyes. So I'm going to seek the things that he's looking at. It has a nose. I'm going to seek the things that are pleasing, a pleasing smell in the nostrils of the Lord. You're like, well, what's that? The Bible tells you. It says it's the sacrifice of praise. It's, it's praise and worship. I'm going to seek the praise of God. I'm going to be a praise to God. I'm going to worship the Lord. Seeking God's face means to let him see things that, sm let him smell things that are pleasing unto him. He has a, his face has ears. Uh, talk to him. How do you seek the face of God? Talk to him. He has ears. He's listening. How do you seek the face of God? Well, he has a mouth. He's speaking to you. I want to I want to seek his words. I want to seek the word of God. Oh, how do you seek the face of God? Well, he, he, a face has expression. I'm going to avoid the things that put a frown upon the, my Lord's face, and I'm going to seek the things that, and do the things that put a smile on his face. That's what it means to seek the face of God. It's to go after those things. And so he says, when you seek God's face, guess what? Seek his face forevermore. Seek the Lord and his strength. That's how you get it. If you're taking notes, Isaiah 40, 29. Isaiah 40, 29 says, He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. So guys, strength is something that's given. It's something that's given from God. God is giving it. And if it's given from God, that means it's part of the grace of God. We don't deserve it. But he gives it anyways. And then in Joshua 1.9, it says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and, good, and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, freaked out. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He goes, notice that it's something commanded. He says, hey, don't, hey, listen, hey, be strong. It's a command. He, and you know, God would never command us to do something if he didn't give the power to do it. And, and, and we are called to be strong. Therefore, he gives us the strength to be strong in the Lord. It comes from him. Nehemiah 8.10 says this. Then he said to them, Nehemiah said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. There's something related to the joy that God gives and the strength that he gives. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Strength is in the joy. Joy, joy is a stability. It's not a, a happiness. It's a stability that happens in our life. A, a knowledge from God, a fruit of the Spirit that says, hey, even though my world may be chaos, I know I have a joy, a steadfastness, a, a strength in the Lord. And, and there's, 
when God gives you joy, he'll, there's strength in that. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The next thing, Ephesians 3.16, listen to what this says. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. So the strength of God is also connected to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us strength. God gives us strength through the Holy Spirit. And let's not even get into all the times. Deuteronomy 31, 6, Ephesians 6, 10, where it says, Be strong. Be, B-E, be, be strong in the Lord. Be, just do it. It's a command, just do it. And, and also, how many times, I don't even have time to write, say them all, how strength is connected with being with the Lord. With Him. He does it. Also, in asking, praying. There is illustration upon illustration of men and women in the Bible that ask for strength in prayer. Multiple. It's something to be asked for. It's a big topic. I don't have time to get into the, fellowship, the strength that comes through fellowship. The strength that comes through the very Word of God. But let me tell you something. The strength that we need. Verse 1. Now Solomon the son of David was strengthened in the kingdom. And the Lord his God was with him. And exalted him exceedingly. God does it. If you need strength today, go to the Lord. He's got you. Because he's all powerful. It's in his very nature. Is not that who God is? Is not he all-powerful? Is not he self-sufficient? He is all those things. It's in his very nature, so let's just go to him and get all the strength we need. It's from the Lord. And in verse 2 it says, And Solomon spoke to all of Israel, and to the captains of thousands and of hundreds, to the judges and to every leader in all of Israel, the heads of the fathers' houses. Then Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was in Gibeon. For the tabernacle of meeting with God was there, which Moses the servant of the Lord had made in the wilderness. But David had brought up the ark of God from Kiriath-Jerim to the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. Now the bronze altar that, was, that, that Beziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made he put before the tabernacle of the Lord, and Solomon and all the assembly sought him, or sought God there. Now, what is being said in this section is there is two different tabernacles at this time. There was one in Gibeon. This is the old school one. This is the one Moses had. This is the one that you first see in the book of Exodus. And God told Moses, build an ark. Build a tabernacle, build a bronze laver, build a candelabra. And he, when Moses went up to the Mount Sinai, he got the Ten Commandments, made of stone, but he also came down with a whole bunch of blueprints, probably. Those blueprints were to make this wonderful, fascinating, awesome tabernacle unto the Lord. It was to be a place where God met with man and man meets with God. It's a place to worship. It's a place to pray. It's a place to have sacrifice, to get atonement for your sin. It was a, a place where business with God was dealt with. Everybody understand that, right? That's the tabernacle. That tabernacle went with them for 40 years in the wilderness. That tabernacle went from uh, into the promised land, crossed the Jordan River. And they set it up, and one of the places, where, and the final place that it landed was Gibeon. And in Gibeon, that's where it was at. That's where it stayed, and that's where people went and prayed. It was up on a hill. It was, it was in a different couple. It was in Shiloh for a little while, then it ended up in Gibeon. When David took over Jerusalem, David wanted the Ark of the Covenant badly in Jerusalem. And so he brought up the Ark of the Covenant, and it was, a, it was a trial, it didn't go too well. But he finally got it up there, and he made a little tent for it, put up a couple curtains. 
and he made a place, a separate private place for the ta- for, for not the tabernacle, but for the Ark of the Covenant. In Jerusalem was the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence was at. But in Gibeon, there was the full tabernacle with the altar, the laver, the tent, the outer white covering, everything that, was, that Moses had was out in Gibeon. And they still used it to worship and to make sacrifice unto the Lord. They still went there. It was on a high place. Now, with these two places, was that against the law? It was, to- hey, God didn't kill anybody over it. It was still happening. God okayed it. But we're really not sure why it was two different places. We don't know why there was two tabernacles there. One was David's tabernacle, that was a small thing just for the ark. And then there was the big tent, Moses' tent in Gibeon. Was it because, the, because David knew the future and how he, how he was going to build a temple for that? I don't know about that because he brought the ark over before, uh, well, before uh, he got clarity on the temple. Some people say that there wasn't enough room in Jerusalem. Some people say because uh, the tabernacle was on a high place and he wanted to get the Ark of the Covenant away from the high place because it, it had a history of paganism and was shared with paganism. We don't know why, but there was two places. But verse 6, it says, Now the bronze altar that Beziel, the, uh, sorry, that's verse 5, verse 6 says, And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar, the big bronze altar, before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. The same one that Moses made, the same one that was with them for such a long time in the wilderness. Solomon goes there and offers a thousand offerings on this altar. I know one thing. I know why Solomon went there, though. Solomon wanted to do it the right way. He knew God's presence was in the Ark of the Covenant. He knew it was there. But he couldn't go and do the things that he needed to do in the Ark of the Covenant. He couldn't make atonement for his sins. He was a king. Only a priest can do that. And a priest can only do that on one day. That was the day of Yom Kippur. So he needed a place to make atonement for his sins, which he knew had to be done. He knew he had to go make worship unto the Lord. He knew he wanted to do that. He wanted to pray. And he knew God had a place for that. And it was the tabernacle. So he went to Gibeon to do it the right way. Isn't that the coolest thing about Solomon? He want, and this and all, was also his downfall. He wanted to do things the right way. And so he went there, did it the biblical way. Offerings and sacrifices. Knowing full well that he's going to bring it all together in this brand new beautiful temple that he's going to make. So the Lord sees all this. And in verse 7, it says, On that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? He's already given him so much. But is not that the essence of God's grace? God's grace. With God, there's always more to be given. Like, oh God, is, it, is, is there more? Is there more? Because God sees, and this is the thing, because God saw the need in Solomon's life. Solomon saw it as well. He's going to admit to it in a second. But because he saw the need, and Solomon saw his own need, for, he needed a little bit of something. He had all the, he had all the coordinations. He had all the materials. But there was something lacking that Solomon knew he needed, and God knew that he needed. And so, He comes to him and says, what shall I give you, Solomon? What do you want? And in verse 8, And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David my father and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David my father be established, for you have made me king over the people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people for who can judge this great people of yours? What? 
Solomon declares the past work of God at the beginning. You're the one who has done it all. You did it. You have shown yourself. You have made me king. But what does he ask for? He asks for wisdom and knowledge. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9, he, he, he asks for it. He says, it says it a different way. Same thing. He says, I want to understand. I want to have a heart to understand and to judge. I want an understanding heart to judge. I want an understanding heart to judge. I got to judge. I got to rule this people. I'm the new king and I need an understanding heart. You know what understanding heart means in the Hebrew? A heart that hears. I need a heart that hears God. And here he says to add on to that, I need wisdom and I need knowledge. Why did he ask for that? What would you ask for if God says, what do you want? And I love how Solomon doesn't take God for a genie. He doesn't say, oh, what do you want? I want him dead. I want that money. I want this stuff. He didn't do that. That's what we, I don't know, I would. I just want six numbers for the Powerball. You know? We have all those things. What would you ask if God said, what do you want? What do you want? And sometimes we just might, be, we might say, oh, I, I, you know, I want this or that, the other. There's, a, there's things. But what does he ask for? He asks for a heart that hears wisdom and knowledge on how to rule the people. I don't know how to rule the people. He, number, first of all, why did he ask this? Number one, so that his promise so that God's promise can be established. He says, you made promises about my dad and to my dad. I am asking for wisdom and knowledge and a heart that hears so that that promise that you promised to my dad may happen. So that that will occur. And number two, why did he ask for this? He saw his need. In 1 Kings chapter 3, he says, I am a little child. I don't know how to go out or come in. Now, for a man, that's a very humbling thing to say. What if our bosses, gentlemen, asked us any type of question? And our would, would our response be, hey, I'm just a kid. I don't know what I'm doing. No way. What do we do? We get... We get, we get we get cocky. We're like, oh, yeah, I can handle that. Well, do you know how to do the specs on this and that's not? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got it. I got it. And then we, we walk around the corner and pull up YouTube and we're like, well, how do we do that? We pull out the instruction manual. We're calling somebody else. And <laughs> we never admit that we're like kids. It's our pride. It's our ego. But here is Solomon saying, hey, I'm a kid. I don't know how to walk out of a room and how to walk into a room. I have no clue. Wow. What should we be asking for? You know what we should be asking for? Not, not a genie list of things, but we need to be asking for that which enables us to serve the Lord better. Did you catch that? I want to ask God for those things in my life that I'm lacking in. I want to ask God for the things that will help me serve the Lord better. To those things, God, that will make the promises that you made about me Come to pass. Lord, I, I, I want to obey your will and I need those things in my life in order to do that. I don't need a million dollars. I don't even need good health. I just need one thing. I need those things in which will enable me to obey you better and to live for you more. Solomon needed two things, wisdom and knowledge and if you want to throw in a heart that hears I, he needed wisdom and knowledge what do you need today what do we need today what, what in your life do you need today in order to serve the Lord better do you need love maybe you're not loving and you don't love the Lord like you should you don't love others like you should I mean, do you need love ask the Lord for it what do you want? God says to you and you say love. Do you need it? Check your heart. Maybe you need grace. Maybe you need grace for your life. Maybe you, you, you lack in grace and mercy. 
You're not giving into the Lord. You're not giving of your time. You're not giving of, of anything. You're just, you're, you're, you're a, a spiritual tightwad. I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about spiritual stuff. You're, you're, sometimes we become misers in our Christian walk. Do you need patience? Maybe that's what you need in order to serve the Lord more. You need patience. You need to wait upon the Lord. And you just don't have that. Your spiritual fuse is stamped with attention deficit syndrome. You, know, just, you, know, oh, and you don't have any patience for the Lord. I want it now. I want to deal with it now. And you're not waiting upon Maybe Do you need patience? Maybe you need holiness. Maybe you need holiness. Maybe there's a perversion in your life. There's something in your life that you just need to confess to the Lord. Maybe there's something that's sinful in your life. And I just need, I need to confess that. Lord, I need your holiness. I need your blood to wash me and cleanse me of this junk that's in my life. And he'll do that. You need forgiveness. Maybe you need forgiveness for the things that happened in your past. And you haven't laid that at the altar of the cross, at the altar at the cross, and you haven't given it to Jesus Christ. And you need to be forgiven for something that you have guilt over. Maybe you need forgiveness for somebody else, that somebody who has hurt you, and you want to, and you you need forgiveness, and you just don't have it. And you just say, Lord, I need it because I, I can't serve you without these things. I can't do what you called me to do without these things. Lord, give me these things. You understand what I'm talking about? Maybe you need the Holy Spirit. I just need power. Ask him for it. What's holding us back from fully living for God? What's holding us back from obeying his call upon our lives? For Solomon, it was inexperience. And so he asked for wisdom and knowledge. For you, it might be something different. Ask him for it. What's holding you back? And you, you make, it's like, what, what is holding me back from being just hardcore for Jesus? And, 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 and so, Lord, search me. Know me. Try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. Is there something that's holding me back from serving you? And when God points it and sheds light upon it, then ask him for what you need to live for him. I need forgiveness. I need your blood. I need your Holy Spirit. I need patience. I need love. Whatever it is. Maybe it, maybe it is wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> Whatever it is, ask for it today. You're never too young. You're never too old. Just get that from the Lord. And in verse 11, when God hears Solomon say that, and God said to Solomon, because this was in your hearts and you have asked not for riches or wealth or honor or for life of your enemies, nor have you asked for long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king, <laughs> wisdom and knowledge will be granted to you. And, but wait, there's more. I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings that have had who were before you nor shall be ever after you will have the like. God goes above and beyond. That's called grace. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God always goes above and beyond. But remember something, guys. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Notice the order. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Make sure you do it the right way. Check your motive, that there's no ulterior motive in your heart. Like, well, you know, if I just serve the Lord, if I play my cards right, I'll get whatever I want. <laughs> no. The joy of our heart, the one desire of our heart is his righteousness, his kingdom. Not some thing that will uh, be there one day and burnt up the next. He'll add everything that we need. 
Success for Solomon and for us is in these three simple things that are seen here. Humility. Humility. If you're taking notes, humility, that was the first step. Humility. He admitted, I got nothing. I'm lacking. I got nothing. And then he called out for the Lord. And so after the humility, there was dependency. Dependency. From you, God, I'm asking for it. I know that from you comes all these things. I'm not asking my psychologist. I'm not asking my mom and dad. I'm not asking my friends. I'm not asking the bank. I'm asking you, God, for the strength that I need. And I depend upon you. Nobody else. Just you, God. I have complete dependency upon you. And he did that. So humility, dependency upon the Lord. And then he had obedience. I want to do it your way, God. Not my way, your way. And there's an order to it. So Solomon came to Jerusalem, verse 13, from the high place that was in Gibeon, from before the tabernacle of meeting and reigned over Israel. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen and all he had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities with the king, uh, and with the king in Jerusalem. Also the king made silver and gold and it was so common in Jerusalem as stones. And he made cedars in abundance as sycamores, which are in the lowlands. So he, he's a, he brought back forests and he was, he was so wealthy there was gold and silver, rocks in the street. It was like common. And Solomon had horses imported from Egypt and Keva. The king's merchants brought them in from Keva and the current price at the current price. And they acquired and imported from Egypt a chariot for six hundred shekels of silver, and a horse for one hundred and fifty. Uh, one hundred and fifty. Thus, through their agents, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. So, they got a they got the these horses, and then they sold them to other countries and the, sold them to other the chariots and they sold them to other there was an import export business going on now we know from Deuteronomy 17 that there's rules for royalty he says don't multiply <laughs> notice we just read that section right first Kings tells us also though he did he says don't multiply for yourselves horses and don't go to Egypt to trade oh crud it's like, man, did he miss that part in Deuteronomy 17? Did it drop off the scroll? What happened? Did he, did he get distracted? Did he, what happened? Don't multiply horses and don't go to Egypt to trade. <laughs> you know, he says, don't, act, don't multiply for yourselves wives. He had a ton of wives and concubines. 700 or something. It was gnarly. He says, don't multiply greatly gold and silver. He says, get gold and silver, but just don't multiply it greatly for yourself. And the other, the last law that for the royalty, the rules for royalty was write a copy of the whole Torah for yourself and carry it with you everywhere like a scepter and read it constantly. Memorize it. He probably did that, but he did everything else. It's like, oh, Solomon, what are you doing? Well, he just had a problem with that. God is to be the, remember, God is to be the kings and countries' defense and wealth. That's what that whole thing meant in Deuteronomy 17. But that's the first chapter. So guys, right now, I just want to take, take some time. And we're going to close there tonight. Let's just ask the Lord to shine a light on our situation. What do you want us to do, God? Just ask him that tonight. What, what do you want me to do? And then, then also ask the Lord, what am I lacking to do it? What is holding me back from obeying you and doing what you called me to do? And Lord, give me what I need to do your will, oh God. So let's just pray this right now, okay guys? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come before you. And we just ask that you would just move tonight. Lord, if there's any man and woman here tonight that just, they just don't know what to do. They don't know your call upon their life. You don't know, they don't know what to do. Lord, I just pray that you would just show them call them to what you have them to do. Lord, what do you want to do with us? 
we're your slaves, we're your servants. What do you want to do with us, Lord? And Father, we ask that you would just, Lord, show us what we're lacking in serving you. Show us what we need. Lord, then give us your spirit. Give us your power. Lord, what, what's holding us back from serving you fully? Is it, is it a lack of grace, mercy, love, patience? Maybe it's a need for power, more dependency upon the spirit and not upon our own flesh. Maybe it's holiness. What's holding me back, Lord? Show me, show us. And Lord, give us what we need to do your will. Give us what we need. Give us a hunger for those things that we need to adequately do what you've called us to do as Christians. We love you, praise you, Lord. Thank you so much. We just want to seek your face. We love you, Lord. Do a work in our hearts, Lord, in your holy name. Amen. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. I love you. Jesus loves you. And take those things home tonight and just pray about it. See if there's anything that's lacking. See if there be anything in your life that you just need. And then ask the Lord for it because he, he'll, because he comes to you and says, hey, what do you need? And he'll give it to you. Amen? I love you and the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. Have a great rest of the week. We'll see you Sunday morning.